finalized. We are starting at 1045 and uh, plan to end on time at noon. Uh, so good, welcome to our session. Uh, we are all in, in an, we're a nation of immigrants and um, all of us have our, our ups and our downs. We're all sort of moving um, or immigrating from one stage of life to another for as long as we live, stretching to reach higher levels of, of happiness and achievement. So I think we can all relate very much to this topic of uh, feeling at times marginalized. We have a wonderful panel of participants uh, who are going to share their experiences with you. Uh, the first is Bonnie Lynn Nadzika. Uh, Bonnie Lynn Nadzika is um, a speaker. She's uh, from uh, New Jersey's Ellis Island, uh, telling the lesser known story of immigration and America's largest public health hospital. Bonnie is the grants manager for Save Ellis Island. She has a bachelor's degree in history from the College of New Jersey and a master's degree in museum professions from Seton Hall University. She spent 12 years as director of the Morris County Historical Society, where she worked on the exhibition and catalog, Many Lands, One Country, The Impact of Immigration on Morris County. She put together several panel discussions on the topic of immigration to accompany the exhibit, which was on display at the Historical Society and later reinstalled at the Morris County Library. Most recently, she was a panelist and moderator for Hudson County and Immigration, the story of America at the Ferry Building at Ellis Island, part of a series presented by the Hudson County Office of Cultural and Heritage Affairs. So we welcome you, Bonnie Lynn Nazika. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here among such a distinguished group of speakers today. Um, I work for Save Ellis Island. It was created in 1999 to oversee the restoration efforts and future use of New Jersey's portion of Ellis Island. Save Ellis Island is the official partner of the National Park Service and has worked to preserve, protect, and restore the 29 buildings on Ellis Island that were once part of the country's largest public hospital complex. The multifaceted and state-of-the-art hospital treated 1.2 million immigrants. You may remember, <laughs> if you live in New York or New Jersey and the area, the controversy and the legal battle between the state of New Jersey and the state of New York as to who owned the Statue of Liberty. Per the 1998 Supreme Court ruling, the statue and the restored portion of Ellis Island, including the Immigration Museum, was awarded to New York as highlighted in dark green on this map. Um, you can see 1998, May 26th. Light green is given to New Jersey, which includes all of the Ellis Island Hospital Complex, and at the time, all of the unrestored buildings. And I'll just leave that statement right there. These gentlemen are from the United States Public Health Service. It went by a few different names. I'm just using one to keep it simple for this brief presentation. And these are the first people that an immigrant met at Ellis Island, not an immigration official, but one of these uniformed doctors who would inspect arriving immigrants from their feet up. Quite literally, they looked at their feet and worked their way up. In their uniforms, these officials would likely have been particularly frightening to those immigrants who were fleeing persecution in their home countries. It is important to note about Ellis Island that all first class passengers and most second class passengers were examined on board their ships and then were free to go. The process at Ellis Island was for the poor huddled masses yearning to breathe free. In 1917, a doctor E.H. Mullen wrote in a document excitingly called Medical Examination of Immigrants, Administration, and Line at Ellis Island, basically what they should be doing on the line, quote, knowledge of racial characteristics in physique, 
costume, and behavior are important in this primary sifting process. Note, here is one of the doctors, and he's referring to it not as a medical process, but a sifting process. I think that says a lot about the attitude of some individuals towards the process. Now, that wasn't the only public health officer you would see as an immigrant. The second public health officer was the infamous eye man. Um, this gentleman here is, is looking for diseases such as trachoma. Some of them use their fingers to flip the eyelid. Some of them used a button hook. It makes one wonder how um, contagious trachoma could have possibly been if they were touching all of these people and probably not washing their hands in between. On the right is a list of chalk marks that were used to indicate suspected illnesses or mental defect. Um, and mental defect was important because there was an X for suspected mental defect, a circled X for definite signs of mental defect, and at the bottom, S for senility. So there was a lot of emphasis on, on mental, um, not mental health, but, but mental, I'm gonna skip that, let's leave it there. <laughs> Um, these brief examinations were championed by anti-immigrant groups that really wanted to keep immigrants out, such as the Immigration Restriction League, which had been founded by a group of Harvard graduates, and proponents of the eugenics movement as a way to maintain the purity of the American populace by keeping unfit immigrants from entering the country. Again, that's a statement I'll leave right there. <laughs> these are some images of immigrants that had to go for further testing. The woman at the right with the white kerchief on her head standing at the desk is actually completing a puzzle. Puzzles were one of several ways that immigrants were tested for mental capacity. They may also be tested for literacy or given simple sums, even children. In the center, a man is having his lungs examined for tuberculosis or other lung ailments. And on the far left, a woman is being examined for favis or other highly contagious scalp diseases that were prevalent and difficult to treat at the time. In 1900, the first hospital was built on Ellis Island. It became immediately evident that the hospital would not be adequate for the thousands of patients who would need to be treated. A second island, which is in the middle portion there, was constructed um, on landfill and the hospital building was built between 1900 and 1901. Able to accommodate 125 patients, medical officers often had to make provisions for over 500 patients in the space. So the hospital pretty much went on an ongoing building project for the next 35 years. A contagious disease hospital, which is what is in the foreground of this photograph, was a standalone hospital with its own administration building, kitchen, laundry, and wards for treating various contagious infectious diseases. So that was the third island created at Ellis Island. And then later on, the land in between those two islands was filled in. So you see the one big island there, although uh, we at Ellis Island refer to it as Island 1, 2, and 3. The Ellis Island hospitals were state-of-the-art hospitals. There were operating theaters, as seen on the right in the photograph, a dentistry, labs, pharmacies, a laundry that operated around the clock, kitchens and dining rooms. The upper left image is the kitchen at the Contagious Disease Hospital. Uh, the only artifact left is the vent hood, which is currently in storage as we work to stabilize this particular area. The lower left image is of the morgue at the Contagious Disease Hospital, and there were more than one morgues. This one served as a teaching morgue, and outside the frame of this image, just if you were to continue the bottom uh, right corner of that image, you would see concrete steps that were used as benches for medical students or for others observing an autopsy. Groups in the New York and New Jersey area were angry about the hospital because they felt that immigrants, non-citizens, were receiving higher quality care than was available in many local hospitals. There were also facilities for the mentally ill. 
then known as the psychopathic ward. The psychopathic ward was initiated, unfortunately, after a patient committed suicide. While the caged off area on the right looks pretty unappealing, especially in its unrestored state, it did provide these patients with the opportunity to get fresh air. And getting the patients fresh air was always of paramount importance, um, all the way up to having the windows open in the contagious disease hospital wards year round, with the heat blasting at the same time. On the left is an actual image of immigrants in the psychopathic ward. It is part of an installation of large scale historic photographs throughout the hospital by French artist JR. And it's just um, a really great way for us to kind of give some faces to these stories that we tell uh, that don't have faces. The diagnosis of mental health was by no means clinical at this time. Per a 1917 article again by doctor, our friend Dr. McMullen with a really long title, one immigrant was deemed, quote, insane, loves America and wishes to defend America, will go into army, delusions of patriotism, end quote. Um, I don't think there's an IDC 10 code for insurance for delusions of patriotism, um, but that's just an example of, of one of the ways that they looked at people and you have to wonder if this poor gentleman was just thinking that if he said this that he would be really appealing to them as a new citizen of the country um, instead they called him crazy a number of hospital patients were children they were separated from their families they were unable to speak or understand the language a lot of times they couldn't even speak to each other because they were from different countries and they had little or no understanding of the sometimes harsh treatments for their illnesses. For example, most notoriously, treatments for the eye disease trachoma were particularly medieval and included the application of silver nitrate and steel wool to the eyes. On the other hand, they did provide children with activities. And on the left is an image of the children outside with nurses. And if you look carefully in the front row, you'll see some children have baskets in their hands. They were making baskets as an activity. And they also received uh, Christmas gifts. So there was some effort and, and even some of the, the oral histories that we have, people recall the nurses being very kind to them. So to give you an idea, of the sheer volume that they were dealing with at Ellis Island. In 1909, this report from the Surgeon General of the Public Health Service states that there were 733,367 immigrants inspected in that year. You can see that 8,321 were admitted to area hospitals. And of that, the majority, 6,186, were admitted to Ellis Island Hospital. Now, on the other hand, as massive as it is and as terrible as some of these stories are, if you look down at the bottom line, the number deported was 218. And almost half of those, 98, were those who were deemed insane. And to give you an idea of the number of medical personnel, there was never enough. Between 1891 and 1898, there were two medical officers who inspected 2,000 to 5,000 immigrants in two lines daily. Some worked seven days a week. By 1911, this increased to 11 officers manning four lines. The hospital was not only clinical, but provided a variety of supports and activities for those being treated. The Ellis Island Hospital Complex provided more than basic care. There were libraries in both the main hospital and the contagious disease hospital as seen here. They actually had a cart of books that they would roll to patients that couldn't get to the library, which the staff called the Tower of Babel because there were so many different languages in the books. They celebrated holidays with special meals, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Jewish meals were cooked in a separate kosher kitchen and the Jewish holidays were celebrated for those patients. The Red Cross operated a recreation building. 
and the Daughters of the American Revolution maintained what is now known as an occupational therapy program long before the term occupational therapy was even in use. Immigrants in that program participated in arts and crafts, listened to and performed music, saw musical and theater performances, and were taught skills such as weaving, knitting, and crochet, to name just a few. The Ellis Island Hospital was a contradiction of good and bad forces, just like the Ellis the Island of Hope, Island of Tears moniker that the Park Service has given to Ellis Island. That's even the name of the little film that you see when you go to Ellis Island, although I think it's closed still for COVID, but Island of Hope, Island of Tears. So on one hand, you had poor immigrants who received a quality of medical care that they would not have received in their home country or even in many parts of this country at that point in time. On the other hand, their families or social service agencies were expected to pay for that care. Many immigrants were returned to their home countries ill, alone, and separated from family. National Archives records demonstrate family requests for continued care going all the way up the chain of command to President Theodore Roosevelt. In one very sad case that we have the record of, a man's son was deported from Ellis Island just prior to officials there receiving a telegram granting a stay of deportation and giving permission for his continued care. Ultimately, in this whole big mess out of the uh, roughly 12 million immigrants that went through Ellis Island, only 1% of immigrants were returned to their home country due to illness real or perceived. Of course, for that 1%, it was um, very unfortunate and, and terrifying. If you watch the great documentary by Lori Conway, Forgotten Ellis Island, there is a woman who talks about a family member who had been sent back and was separated uh, from her nuclear family for the rest of her life. So there was definitely some amazing, miraculous things that happened there and some horrible, traumatizing things happened there. It was not one or the other. And this is really just a very small overview of the story of Ellis Island. It was also used in World War I and World War II as a hospital for military personnel. In the last period of its use, it was operated by the Coast Guard. There's just a lot of stories to be told. And if you're interested, you can visit the hospital for a hard tech tour. Information about tours on Ellis Island and other state Ellis Island programs can be found on our website. We also have more information, photographs. We have a bookstore, and that is www.saveellisisland.org. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. It was really an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Um, we have Linda coming on to join us again. Okay. I'm back again, and I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who will be Katie Singer, and her, uh, her, her remarks will focus on how we got to Newark stories of the Great Migration. Ms. Singer has a PhD, or rather I should say Dr. Singer, has a PhD in American Studies from Rutgers University, Newark, and an MFA, Master's in Fine Arts in Creative Writing from Fairleigh Dickinson University. Most recently, she was history on the history faculty at Rutgers University, uh, but just recently relocated from New Jersey to California. Dr. Singer has presented at conferences in the US and abroad upon topics that include preservation, oral history, racial justice, African-American literature, and African-American historical commemoration. Her book on the Great Migration through the Oral Histories of Newark's Kruger Scott African American Oral History Project is under contract with Rutgers University Press. Welcome, Katie. Good morning. Thank you so much. I am going to share my screen. Okay, 
Uh, good early morning from Los Angeles, everybody. Uh, I am so glad to be here to speak about one of my favorite subjects hosted by truly one of my favorite organizations. So I wanna talk about the Great Migration. So now we're talking about folks who within this country who are moving for various reasons. Some of them shared uh, reasons with the immigrants that we just heard about coming to Ellis Island. So I wanna start by talking about Jacob Lawrence, an artist who in 1941, he finished a series of 60 paintings along with simple captions for each one. He wanted to tell the story of this historical event, the Great Migration, the migration of African-Americans to points east, north, and west in the 20th century. In 1993, he retitled the series from the Migration of the Negro to the Migration Series, and he changed almost all the captions as well. This is an excellent way to understand the Great Migration, especially during and post-World War II. People often talk about the Great Migration as two different phases, uh, maybe one around 1910 to 1940, and then the second one, 1940 to 1980. Nothing exact, though. Another way to understand New Jersey's, especially the Great Migration, is through this wonderful book by the late historian Giles Wright. And the Historical Commission, of course, knows what a loss it was uh, when Giles passed. If anyone is interested in this book, they can simply Google it and um, a PDF is available now. And yet another way for us to learn about the Great Migration is through oral histories. So this is the website for the Kruger Scott Oral History Collection. It's 107 interviews based on an 80 question questionnaire. Uh, they they are asked everything from where they went to church, what kind of food they ate when they were in the South, um, community and political work, and they're interviewed by their peers, right? So people that they know, which makes it really different. And anyone can access this website right now. Uh, we are needing to make it more searchable, but hopefully that will come later. So what I wanna talk about uh, is the great migration based on this oral history collection. So here's the first Jacob Lawrence painting I want to use as a sort of illustration. D jobs, okay, were a big reason that folks migrated to, to industrialized cities like Newark. Um, industry was booming in Newark from shipping at Port Newark to factories making everything from paper cups to glass tubes for televisions. Uh, World War I era migration still had a lot of African-American folks coming to places like Newark and still being in the service and domestic jobs. <clears throat> uh, just I was just checking the chat. Um, some immigrants chose to some immigrants. Uh, chose to fight in their home country's armies at the same time that scores of American men were going off to war. So this created a labor shortage. And so that African Americans, as well as women for the first time, really, finally enjoyed access to well-paying factory jobs, although this was often temporary. So many African Americans got work in Newark and other industrialized cities around New Jersey. So many factories were turning out war materials. And as you know, that's uh, unfortunately always a boon for the economy. So these jobs weren't being provided because there was a sudden lack of racism. It was these companies were often just desperate for workers in this fast growing economy. There's another reason that a lot of African Americans left the South, and that was life and death. Uh, for a long time, the South was an extremely racist place to live as a Black American. Lynchings and other violence perpetrated by whites was common. Of course, the, the North was not always as welcoming as it promised to be either. 
So Willa Rollins uh, was one of the folks interviewed for Kruger Scott. She worked for the Urban League, and she said, my father had preceded us to Newark. My uncles felt it was better for my father to be at Newark because he had a hot temper, and they didn't want to see him hanging from a tree down there, period. Racist violence, that was a constant threat in the South. One of the many facets of injustice was the sharecropping industry, typically keeping Black and poor families in debt through illegal means. Unfortunately, some Northern employers and business owners, including some of those small mom and pop shops like on Springfield Avenue and Prince Street in North, they modeled this form of exploitation by keeping African Americans in debt through uh, on credit buying, unwarranted paycheck deductions, and the like. Now, many people simply wanted to give their children the chances in life that they had just not had access to. Lots of the Kruger Scott folks, they were children when they came to Newark. Uh, Willa Rollins, who we just heard from, was four years old when she got to Newark. Uh, John B. Ross, he came at age five in 1924 from Georgia. Ethel Richards was nine years old. She arrived in 1927, and she remembered living in a six-family tenement on Boston Street. Many of these narrators who during the interview sessions were 70, 80 years old, had vivid memories of coming to Newark as children. Now, people went a lot of different places during the Great Migration, and unfortunately, New Jersey often gets overlooked as a common destination. People came by train, bus, car to places like Newark and Trenton, for example, and sometimes they simply got off wherever the train stopped, and that would be their destination, whether it was Chicago, Pittsburgh, Detroit, or Newark. Now, Mayor Sharp James, who was interviewed for the Kruger Scott Collection, shared a story of being very young when his mother took him and his brother and fled their Jacksonville, Florida home. He said, one morning she woke us up very early in the morning, took no belongings, went down to the train track, lit a fire to stop the train. I always remember how you stop trains in the South at the location, build a fire by the railroad. The train stopped, we got on it. Now, George Branch, he was a longtime city councilman, um, and he described his experience through some very detailed memory. We traveled by train. My mother was able to save up the little money that we made, you know, on the farm, and my aunt, I think she contributed to it. The train was clean. The porters was very nice and courteous on there, most all of them black in those days. They help you with your luggage and your bag and getting on the train, you know. They had food available, but we packed our little food from down home. We packed it in a shoebox. We ate chicken, ham, biscuits, you know, and all that wrapped up in a shoebox. So, you know, you ate when you got ready, so you didn't have to go order anything and pay for it. The trains was segregated in those days and times. There were certain sections, you know, for Blacks and then for Whites. The Whites and the Blacks are not sitting together on the train at all called the black section, you know, all black folks, you know, we had all our boxes and bags piled up, you know, all over the place. Now, housing was, of course, an issue in the South as well. Um, living conditions were definitely a motivator for some Southern Blacks to leave home. Uh, sometimes the migrants' new homes were much improved from the South when they came North but other times um, not so much. Uh, Mayor Sharp James once again described a typical apartment for poor migrants in Newark circa 1940. And we were finding one room apartments where people were gouging us with rent and everything else. And that's how we lived. Everybody you'd walk out in the hall with five different rooms. People didn't rent apartments there. It was a room that had families in it because that's all we could afford. Now, the Great Migration is defined as having lasted for at least the first three quarters of the 20th century, so not everyone left at the same time or for the same reason. 
One myth that is um, often goes along with the Great Migration was that everybody was poor, but actually large numbers of educated, professional African Americans were a part of this migration. And it's why cities like Newark have the industries and the institutions that they do. The Kruger Scott Oral History Collection, for example, features doctors, politicians, clergy, radio personalities, musicians, activists, journalists, poets, psychologists, and law enforcement officers, among others. Not everyone got along either. It's always important for us to remember that just because everybody shares a race or a culture or a geographical background doesn't mean they're all the same. And there were issues among, for example, the Black newcomers and those who had been living in cities for much longer. There was a self-consciousness with some of the Northern migrants that sometimes resulted in a disregard for their Southern counterparts. Now, Newark native Amiri Baraka, earlier known as Leroy Jones, wrote about this in his book, Blues People. And he speaks to the differences between those who had arrived first to the Northeast and then the migrants who came up later, still somewhat unfamiliar with the ways of their new world. Now, of course, church was an integral bond in this evolution of these changing Black urban communities. Now, Owen Wilkerson, who was a reporter for the Newark Evening News, explained something about churches. Outside of the church, on the street and whatnot, or within a community, I think I had mentioned, you know, we as kids, we sort of ostracized the kid who came from the South and whatnot because of his or her talk or his clothing. I really have a lot of respect for the Black church. So Wilkerson was talking about the ways in which inside the church, some of that, uh, that schism between old uh, migrants and new uh, disappeared. Uh, this happens to be one of the many active churches in Newark, Bethany Baptist Church, now at 275 West Market Street. Um, here it is at its first site in 1871, and like so many Black churches, it started in someone's home. So churches were some of the first communities that new migrants joined, but of course not everyone went to church or thought it was the best thing for the community. And as we know, religious affiliation in the African-American population has decreased throughout the decades, as it has in most demographics. So cities like Newark have been molded by this historical event through architecture, social structure, politics, commerce, and culture. If there has to be a takeaway or a bottom line to all this, that it's just that not one kind of person left one kind of place for one kind of reason. The Great Migration, known to many of us as a form of mass rebellion against racism, was as complicated as the approximately six million people who participated in it. The Great Migration made America what it looks like today, and America made the Great Migration a necessity for many African Americans. There are lots of stories of migration and immigration attached to our country, but this particular period was the most transformative of them all when it comes to who we are today. And until the stories of the people who participated in this momentous event are heard, we are going to have a hard time progressing from where we are today. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, next, we will have Linda um, again. Please join us to read next two speakers' bios. Thank you so much. So thank you uh, also, Katie, from me. Uh, our, next two, uh, our next topic is coming north during the Great Migration, stories from our state capital, Trenton. And we'll be led by Jocelyn White and Patricia Atkins. So Jocelyn Francis White, was born and raised in Trenton, New Jersey, and she holds both a Master of Arts in Teaching from Montclair State University and a Master of Arts in Educational Leadership from the College of New Jersey, as well as a Bachelor's in African American, uh, African and African American Studies from Douglas College Rutgers University, where we first met. 
Um, Ms. Rances White served in the Trenton Public Schools for 40 years in both teaching and leadership positions. Since retiring in 2016, Ms. Frances White has continued to be involved in educational and cultural activities in Trenton and Mercer County. These include the annual African-American History Bowls for Trenton area high school students, a virtual African-American art competition for Mercer County middle and high school students, and events commemorating June 5th, Juneteenth, as well as serving as a trustee for the Trent House Association. In addition to these volunteer roles, Ms. Frances White is owner of the Big Easy Restaurant in downtown Trenton, which serves Cajun, Creole, and soul food. And again, as I said, we have two presenters. Our second presenter on this topic will be uh, coming north during the Great Migration Stories from Trenton is Patricia Atkins. And Ms. Atkins has many years of experience in both law and education. She currently serves on New Jersey's Amistad Commission and as trustee for the Trent House Association. She and Ms. Frances White initiated the association's Great Migration Oral History Project and were among the initial core cohort of projects funded by the New Jersey Council for the Humanities Community History Program. So welcome both Jocelyn and Pat. It's an honor to be asked to participate, and we are certainly um, de delighted to do so. I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, there we go. Now we can see you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to talk about, firstly, the mission of the uh, Trent House and the fact that um, we are endeavoring to present the authentic, comprehensive and complete based on what is known from solid research while not shying away from difficult, painful or shameful aspects of what we found. Our communities are a wide range of people for whom we believe that the history of the Trent House and its peoples are relevant. Connecting the past with today and tomorrow, and we present history as a springboard for critical analysis of how we got to where we are and implications for how we are to continue what is valuable and change as we can, what is harmful. The 1719 William Trent House in the past essentially focused on the male owners and inhabitants of our house and the land. However, we know that native people were here thousands of years um, before any other immigrants. Those other immigrants began with the Europeans who came after the Lenny Lenape and who brought with them um, people from Africa who were enslaved. We have proof that the Lenni Lenape Indians and their ancestors were here because of the archeological digs uh, that we conduct on the um, grounds of the Trent House and the artifacts that were found as a result of those digs. The original owner, William Trent, was an immigrant from the Western part of Europe, Scotland. And he was one of the many immigrants who came over the centuries to Trenton. Those other immigrants included people from Eastern and Southern Europe in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Immigrants came to a new place to better themselves and to have a better life. That's what Trent and other English colonists did, 
and that's what the later immigrants did. Trenton was attractive because it had many factories, such as the Roebling Wire Works, the manufactured wire for the suspension bridges, such as the George Washington and the Golden Gate Bridges, Lenox, China, American Standard ceramic kitchen and bathroom fixtures, and many, many more. Trenton drew migrants from the South, just as it did earlier, immigrants from Europe. The migration of um, African-Americans from the South to the North, the Midwest and the West was one of the largest migrations in history and it had a major impact. For the Trent House, our neighborhood changed from Russian Jewish immigrants to African-Americans during this period of time. By this time, the Jewish families had prospered and moved up, moved out with their children to the suburbs. The Trent House also observed the impact of national policies and business practices in our neighborhood and on our African-American neighbors. The image on the left is from a map in the early 20th century, which shows factories on the left side of the Trent House property, which is outlined in red, and working class row houses on the other three sides. The middle image shows redlining. That is a federal policy during the depression that rated neighborhoods credit worthiness based on factors like race, ethnicity, family income, et cetera. And you can see that the area around the Trent House was in the red zone. That was a poor credit indication and led to disinvestment in the neighborhood. The image on the top right is a photo of our neighborhood in the early mid 60s, 1960s, after it was urban renewed. In actuality, this was dispossession of African-American families from the area and increased pressure on other African-American neighborhoods in the city because there had been no new construction uh, for which they could move to. As Jocelyn will describe, the African-Americans who came from the South to Trenton experienced both opportunities and challenges. People who came were able to get decent jobs, their children attend school and have a better life. But there were also challenges of policies like redlining and those due to discrimination. The sociologist uh, Richard Rothstein has called all of this state-sponsored segregation. And I'll turn this over to Jocelyn. Greetings. What was, what was life like in Trenton? Many of the newly transplanted migrants from the South encountered racial discrimination and segregation. They often discovered that the so-called land of milk and honey in the North was not always a pleasant, welcoming environment. Sometimes it was not radically different from the places they left behind. The employment opportunities were limited, often last hired, first fired. This was a typical scenario. The competition for employment was fierce. The European immigrants were the preferred candidates for the better paying positions. Transplanted African-Americans developed their own institutions. They were very self-reliant. They had their own churches, cemeteries, newspapers, schools, community centers, YMCA branches, etc. One particular street, Spring Street, was a popular residential hub for the African-American middle class. The physicians, the dentists, the attorneys, the educators all resided on this particular street in Trenton. 
On a personal note, the bottom photograph is of my maternal grandfather, Reverend Charles W. Nelson Sr., an Episcopal priest conducting Easter Mass at St. Monica's Episcopal Church, which was also located on Spring Street. Our project, Patricia Atkins and Sam Stevens, who's our executive, inter, um, executive director of the Trent House, conceived the idea of our Great Migration Project. Dr. Linda Caldwell Epps presentation on the Great Migration to Newark, New Jersey, served as an inspiration for the Trent House to embark on a similar study. So we wanna thank Dr. Epps for encouraging us. The seminal work, The Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkerson is the prototype for our project. We convened two focus groups with local stakeholders to determine the direction of the project. We were and are seeking individuals or family members who traveled to Trenton from the South during the 1930s through the 1960s. Our research also will include background information to enhance the interviews. We are most fortunate to collaborate with Professor Rob McGreevy from the College of New Jersey and Ms. Althea Muse, Director of the Bonner Scholars Program, also at the College of New Jersey, and also Dr. Linda Caldwell Epps, who did a few presentations with the college students. We hosted three sessions at the College of New Jersey, which comprised of panelists who shared their great migration stories with the college students. We reassembled after the presentations and the students had an opportunity to interview the panelists utilizing our script to ensure consistency in questions posed. The students have been instrumental in assisting with interviews, transcriptions, research, digital archives, and exhibits. Examples from the interview. We interviewed Mr. and Mrs. Reed, and Mr. Reed told us why he left South Carolina. Everyone was farming. They didn't allow no industry to come in here. You had to farm or do nothing. And the reason I'm here in New Jersey was because I wanted to get a job and make some money and I couldn't make it down there. So how was life for him in Trenton? Well, I'm gonna tell you something. I don't like to say it, but it happened. I worked for six or seven dry cleaners cause I would work for some of them, sometimes two months and they didn't do right. They favored light skinned black people. And it is interesting to note that there is a reverse great migration as many African-Americans are returning to the South to the Southern roots. Plans and next steps. We will continue to conduct additional interviews and background research. And recently I just met a gentleman on Monday of this week whose family came to Trenton from Dillon, South Carolina. He expressed an interest in being interviewed. I discovered we had interviewed his cousin and many of the people that migrated to Trenton were originally from Dillon. We also want to develop an archive for interview recordings and supplementary documents, photographs, pertinent information. It is our intention to utilize story map to organize our materials. Lessons learned. Our great migration project, as my beloved mother used to say, is more than a notion. It is definitely a long-term undertaking that is extremely labor intensive. I am often questioning why Pat Atkins engaged me to participate in this endeavor, but I am grateful to be an integral part of the study. These are important stories from people that have been frequently marginalized and overlooked. It is imperative that these stories are captured as soon as possible. Time is of the essence. Another challenge we face is our student volunteers are not historians. They do not possess that skill set. An added challenge is how to make the best use of their time. We only have them for a semester. But the students seem to express an appreciation for the opportunity to learn from individuals. Many things 
that will never be found in a history book. We discovered that involving students presents wonderful opportunities, but it also presents a myriad of challenges. Ultimately, we believe the students as well as our committee benefited from their participation. In conclusion, we sincerely hope that you found value in our endeavor. Thank you for listening. Thank you. At this time, we will ask all of the <clears throat> panelists to come back on camera. And I'm going to once again invite um, our, our listeners or our viewers to offer any comments or questions that they may have in our chat. I am uh, wondering, uh, my, my question, I'll send a first question out to all of you. If you interviewed any of the people who migrated or immigrated uh, to New Jersey, I, I know that there were challenges, but I think what would you say was the biggest challenge for them? Um, was it fitting in? Was it finding a place to live? Was it finding a job? What seemed to be the overwhelming challenge for them that presented the most difficulty? And it's to all of you, anyone. I, I'll, I'll jump in mm -hmm. just listening to the Kruger-Scott oral histories. Um, I, I do think the culture shift was the largest because that does affect housing and jobs and you know church and everything um you know the south is a very different place to live especially in the earlier part of the 20th century um and i do think for some there was as was referenced in that um amazing presentation about trenton um you know a surprise and disappointment for some that the north was not all that it was uh reported to be. I, I don't see, Bonnie, has she joined us for this? Yes, Bonnie's on screen, everyone is on screen. Oh, okay, so I'm just not seeing her. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, Jocelyn and Pat, you mentioned that there's a re people that are returning uh, to the to the South. Um, just curious about that. What are, what are the reasons? And are, are they returning to their place of origin or to different parts of the South? Well, um, what I learned is that uh, starting back in the 70s, people um, returned to the South mainly because the opportunities had changed so uh, significantly from the uh, 1920s and 30s. Um, after that, um, people um, who had actually been the persons who had left the South for jobs and better opportunities during the um, 40s, um, as was mentioned, um, particularly as a result of uh, World War II, and had um, done well for themselves, wanted to go back home. And they had opportunities um, for housing and even jobs, even though many of them were retired, that they couldn't have dreamed of mm -hmm. um, 40 or 50 years earlier. And also many people had land that still was in their family. So mm -hmm. they wanted to go back and reclaim their heritage. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I actually have a son who just did that. He never lived uh, in the South, but he's gone back to Virginia to reclaim land that that um, had been in the family since 1868. So I'm familiar yeah, with that. I, I, would, I would also add um, the fact that, um, with, as was mentioned, jobs were not always um, what we would have hoped they would have been when mm -hmm. people came um, to the North. But when the war, World War II, um, began and so many uh, people had left to either go back to, uh, to Europe or to go into the military, jobs were available for African-Americans due to the 
um, actions of FDR, who um, directed these um, uh, factories um, uh, that they would have to, in order to get uh, contracts from the federal government, they had to open up their employment. And I don't know if someone else might want to speak to that. Mm. No? No well, takers on that. Okay, know, go ahead, um, Joseph. I know that my grandmother was very active in Trenton and training people to work at General Motors. So she wanted to make sure that they were prepared when they went in, the jobs were available, but you needed mm -hmm. to have a certain level of preparation before you entered the workforce. Mm -hmm. So there were various programs that prepared people to uh, assume those positions. Good, thank you. So I'm wondering, um, you know, people usually move for a reason. And uh, one of the questions in our chat is what are um, strategies or advice when dealing with histories that may be associated with pain and trauma, especially when mixed uh, with moments of hope and aspiration. How do you discuss these complex moments? I, and I, I guess this writer is referring to when you were taking the oral history, how, how do you deal with, with the trauma and the stress that was associated with their, the migration or immigration? And it's open to anyone. Well, I, I could speak to that. Mm -hmm. um, um, Many of the people, indeed most, um, have been in their late 80s and 90s, and, as, and late 90s as well. Mm -hmm. um, and um, they have had um, an outlook that has been positive. Um, they, to a person, never presented themselves as victims. Mm -hmm. They talked about their experiences. They mentioned the negative aspects, but it was never with a negative attitude. Um, I would say um, that most of us um, who are also the, the descendants of those uh, uh, migrants are very happy that our parents um, made the move. Mm -hmm. Good, uh, thank you. Any other comments on that? Um, I must add that some people just did not wish to be interviewed. One of my dear friends from high school, her mother emigrated here from South Carolina and I wanted to interview her and she said, no, we just don't talk about it, it's too painful. So I reached out to her older brother and he said, oh, I really don't remember because I was busy uh, hanging out with my friends and I didn't really listen when my mom talked about it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times the trauma is real and it has really just, it, it has not gone away. So everybody wasn't open to being interviewed. Yeah. yeah. But the people that we did interview seemed like they did well. They were successful. Um, for example, Mrs. Reed, she said that she did not want to be a farmer and she wasn't going to marry a farmer. But in spite of all that, she has the most beautiful garden, vegetable garden <laughs> in her backyard. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for my own family, uh, their way of dealing with the trauma was just not discussing home at all. I didn't find out where my mother uh, was from until after her death. And then a cousin told me, but they never went back to visit and they never had uh, visitors come uh, from the town that they came from in South, uh, Southwest Georgia. Uh, I'm going to go to another question. Um, uh, it says that this person says, I recently saw a talk about Italian immigration in Philadelphia. And a lot of the discussion was about how the immigration was back and forth, a back and forth relationship. Many Italian immigrants and their children would go back to visit their homeland. Is this a pattern that can be seen with other groups settling in New Jersey? Absolutely. Um, not just uh, in New Jersey, but groups settling all over the place. If you, um, there's a book um, that I know the author about the Irish aboard the Titanic. 
And a lot of those Irish individuals that were in third class weren't just people who were coming to New Jersey as Im or the U.S. as immigrants, but they had gone home to see family members and were on their way back to the United States. Um, and I know even my own grandmother, who was a Scottish immigrant, uh, would go back to Scotland uh, every summer to see her sisters. So there was definitely back and forth um, at all time periods um, of people in, um, from different groups um, wanting to see people at home or not. And there's people that didn't go back to, but, but there was definitely groups that went, um, individuals that went back and forth between their quote home country in the United States. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Bonnie, there's another question here about the history of medicine um, has a new resonance for us in the wake of COVID. How do teachers and students respond to the history of the hospital on Ellis Island? And do any of your programs explore comparisons with healthcare in other parts of the United States at the time? Well, we are... Um still working on um, educate, getting our education programming um, back up to full speed, but that is an area that we know we want to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that we've talked about, you know, all along about, um, especially because most of our tour goes through the Contagious Disease Hospital. So we see this as a real opportunity now to um, discuss not just the history of medicine and, and how medicine might be different in New Jersey than somewhere else, but also an opportunity just to talk about this whole idea. I mean, some of the things that you will read about Ellis Island in the medical uh, hospital are similar to things you would read about um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, people saying, you know, I've heard people say, well, you know, the, the shutdown was just, it didn't do anything. Well, how do you know? What was the alternative? <laughs> you know, if we didn't do the shutdown, you know, it's so I think there's so much um, that can be explored and discussed and um, will be especially relevant with these children and students who have actually lived for the, through a pandemic. I think before the pandemic, you know, they kind of came through the contagious disease hospital and, you know, OK, well, Fabus and you know kids had but, but it wasn't a, a real thing to them so I think um, there's going to be um, opportunities now and opportunities moving forward. Okay thank you. I have another question for uh, Pat and Jocelyn and this says wonderful presentations Miss Atkins and Miss Francis White how will uh, the materials you are collecting be made available to the public and are there any plans to create teaching resources for classrooms that utilize this material? Uh, yes, there will be plans for that. The um, original intention and continuing uh, intention, I should say, is that all of the materials will be maintained in the archives uh, at the Trent House. And of course, they will be open to the public, but um, even more important, um, everything will also be duplicated and maintained in the Trenton Free Public Library. We have a section there known as the Trentoniana Room, and everything um, will be deposited there um, for the public. And they have a trove of materials going back to the mid-1800s. Um, when they even have correspondence going back and forth um, with Frederick Douglass. I'd, I'd like to um, speak to another question um, that was posed, and that is that in my experience, um, people went back and forth, the children of the migrants. Um, I myself grew up in um, the South and in Trenton, and um, my um, cohort of um, people, um, children went back and forth and most of us spent the summers in the South with relatives because our parents mm -hmm. were working. And a most salient example of this is Emmett Till. That's exactly what he was doing, mm -hmm. going South from Chicago to Mississippi 
uh, for the summer. Okay. So I'm wondering, and this is a question that I'm, I'm throwing out to, to all of you. Um, and given that we're now in, in 2022, there's still immigration and migration uh, going on in our country. Do you see any uh, par uh, parallels or uh, two of the history that you have done in talking to all of, of your people and researching um, Ellis Island and uh, uh, research and talking to people about their lives in New Jersey. Any parallels to the immigration that's going on now that, that you, you've seen in all of your research? I know because it's a big topic these days. So I'm wondering if, yeah, how it relates to the, what you saw happened half a century ago or, or, um, or a century ago. In terms of Ellis Island, it's really interesting um, over the years, um, I've worked there for since 2019. And if you read some of the things, especially the anti-immigration materials, I mean, it's like you're reading a, news, a, a newspaper from today. Um, it's, it's almost the identical arguments. You know, these people are coming here, they don't learn to speak the language, they're dirty, they're poor, they're never gonna assimilate. Um, it's it's shocking how similar it is. Hmm. I mean, I oh, go ahead. No, any any one of you go ahead, Katie. I, I was just gonna say that it's you know these places where people of the Great Migration have you know settled and essentially created communities. They're now being pushed out of because of development, because of soaring housing prices, um, because people with um, more resources are able to work remotely, um, jobs aren't where they used to be. And so it, to me, there's this irony that places like Newark that were essentially created by folks of the Great Migration, um, they're having, they're being forced as well as choosing to leave and find places where they can actually afford to live and work. I would also add to that, that, you know, nothing is um, all one anything and that there was good and there was bad as a result of the great migration. And as Isabel Wilkerson points out in her book, when you look at all of these urban um, centers, cities that have had uh, African-American mayors, they all were children of the great migration, those initial um, mayors. The only one that was different was the mayor of uh, uh, African American mayor of San Francisco, Willie um, Brown, I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he was not a son of the Great Migration. He himself migrated to um, uh, California as a young person. So we've had positives and we've had negative. And it's all very much parallel to what Beth brought out about the immigrants um, from, from Europe. Um, I was thinking about the parallels at the time that she was uh, describing that. Mm. Okay. Good. Well, I thank all of you very much uh, for joining us this morning. I think it's been a a, a fruitful conversation. Um, keep up the, the wonderful work that you're doing. Um, the more we find out about the people of the United States, the more we understand about the culture of the United States and the better are, we are equipped to handle those problem areas or those challenges. And the more we're able to enjoy the, the goodness and the richness uh, that the country has to offer. So uh, thanks to the Historical Commi uh, Commission for sponsoring this program and this workshop in particular. And uh, good luck to all of you in the work that you've been doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.